So welcome again. So we'll do brief introductions and then we'll go um, into the webinar that we have planned for you today. So my name is Vanessa Quince and I'm currently a social research scientist at Public Health Seattle King County. Um, my typical work right now, I am working as the community engagement liaison um, for SCAN, um, the at home testing kit for COVID-19. But my pre-COVID life, I um, I am the evaluator for King County Zero Youth Detention Initiative, and I work alongside with Sarah J um, in providing capacity building workshops for community partners. So we do um, workshops that talk about like how to do a logic model, what are performance measures, how to conduct a focus group, because we want to make sure that the power of evaluation goes back into the hands of community for them to use it in, the, in whatever way they see fit. Sarah J. Hi everyone, my name is Sarah J. Sanford. I've also been supporting coronavirus response at King County for the last few months. And before that, um, I worked on the Best Arts for Kids data and evaluation team and with Communities Count providing support and technical assistance um, to our community partners. Um, let's see, I use she, her pronouns. Thank you. So the way that Sarah J and I have crafted this is um, in the teasers, I think so Sarah J and I presented little teasers in two of the county meetings. So the community, um, the community based organizations meeting as well as the community navigators meeting where we did just like high level overviews of what the different dashboards available are. But in general, the way that we're going to proceed with this webinar is just make it based off of questions, right? So we have a list of questions um, that we um, gathered in terms of like stuff that community's interested in. So I will go into two questions that we have prepared and then I will turn over to Sarah J for her to, because she's been manning the chat box, um, jotting down some of the questions that came up as a result of the chat box. Um, she will navigate the dashboards in that way. And then we'll break you up into groups, um, which will be five to seven minutes where we have additional questions um, for you to discuss amongst each other. And then we'll bring it back out to a larger group discussion. We have an hour allotted. I think as we've all like been in these like virtual spaces, um, Sometimes time is on your side, but oftentimes it's not. So just throwing that out there that we might not be able to get to everything, but we're, we'll do what we can. So the first question um, that we have prepared today is, are there certain areas of county that are at higher risk of exposure to COVID-19? And this is based off of positive positivity. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so typically when I'm looking for the COVID-19 screen, I just I type in COVID-19 King County and it brings me to this screen. So the exact web address should be on the top. So kingcounty.gov um, slash department slash health COVID-19. But like I said, if you type in something, if you type it into the Google search engine, you should take it there. It should take you there. So this is the screen that you will go to. Right now, these are, there are six dashboards that are available. Um, and this is a new feature that I, real, that I found out this morning as I was prepping a little bit, um, that you have information on how often the different dashboards are being updated. So you have the daily summary dashboard, and that's the one that I'm gonna go into right now. That's updated daily, where you have some other ones that are updated more weekly. So to go back to the question, are there certain areas of county that are at higher risk of positivity for COVID-19? So to answer that question, I would go to the daily summary dashboard right here. And I would say that this is the main um, summary dashboard, right? So Atar, Sarkis, and Tigran, if I'm um, misinterpreting, let me know. Um, but this is the one that I would say has a lot of the data and a lot of the general data that you would need in order to answer some of the questions that you're interested in. So if we're looking at certain areas of county, I would scroll down. So the first tab is going to be a general um, summary of what's going on in King County. So you have positivities, you have the amount of people being tested, you have hospitalization rates, and then you have death due to COVID-19 like illness. If we're looking for um, certain areas and regions, then you'd go to the geography tab right here. And here, the wonderful a &I team they have conceptualized geography in four different ways. So we have city, 
right? We have health reporting area, and that's something that um, is calculated within public health circles. We have zip code, so you can also look at it by zip code. And then we have census tract. So census tracts are smaller, um, and this is some of the information that is calculated by the census each year in terms of geography. Also, one of the things that you, you can also toggle between the number of people tested, the number of positivities, hospitalizations, and death rates. So each of these different geographic regions, you can toggle between these different um, features and get to the, and get to the um, numbers that you're interested in. So just for simplification purposes, I'm gonna look at the positives, right? So looking at positive by city. And I think city is one of the things that we can all um, wrap our heads around because we all like live within a city within King County. So if you look at the legend, the darker blues correspond with higher rates of positivities, and then the lower regions can, um, corresponds with lower rates of um, positivity. And you have this disclaimer at the bottom, the overall county rate of positive cases is 515.9 per 100,000 cases. So let's zoom in to see what are some of the areas that have the higher positivity rates. So as we can see, if we look at the map of King County, South King County tends to have higher positivity rates than North King County. So here, if we look at Renton, right, there have been 651 positive test results at a rate of 644.2 per 100,000 residents. So if we think about how Renton compares to the overall King County population, they're higher than the overall King County population. And that might be a way to think about how do we prioritize resources in this area, giving the higher positivity rates. We also have this really dark region here, SeaTac, that is another area. So they have um, a positivity testing rate of 1,092 per 100,000 residents. Once again, that is higher than the overall King County rates. And then if we look at North King County, they tend to have um, lighter blue shades. So they have lower rates of positivity compared to the general population. So Seattle, being that um, the Chinook building is in Seattle, if we look at Seattle, 442 per 100,000 residents, which means that it's lower than the King County average. And once again, you can find this by number of people tested, And this, this kind of points to the disparities, right? So if we, if we remember the first graph and looking at the positivities, it's darker in the lower regions. But when we look at who's actually being tested, that is darker in the northern regions, right? So thinking about what are these, what are these different data points telling us and informing us about how we might need to move um, forward later on. Vanessa, uh, we got a question in the chat box about zip codes. I know cool. that's one of the geography options here. Uh, the question is, can you type in a zip code? So if you use the toggle feature, you put in the zip code and then it'll zoom in. And then once again, like the rest of the maps, you hover over it and then it gives you um, the, the number given that um, certain zip code. Um, in this daily outbreak summary dashboard, um, you can see a variety of um, which is taking a moment to load. If you've spent time on our dashboards, you may uh, notice that this happens occasionally. Um, so what we're looking at in the daily summary and the geography that Vanessa showed us, this has the summary of all of the cases, um, all of the testing, all the hospitalizations, and all the deaths that we have tracked from the very beginning of the outbreak. And if you're curious in uh, more recent data, Sargis points out that the geography over time might be um, a potentially more helpful spot to go to. So this you can actually toggle the time period that you're interested in. Here we're looking at um, the couple weeks from June 24th to July 8th, which is yesterday, um, and see how the rates changed in different geographies over time. So that's one thing uh, that came up in the dashboard that I just wanted to demonstrate. Um, were there any other questions about this in particular before we look at a couple other items? So there was one about the economic mm -hmm. um, and social data. And mm -hmm. is there a way to identify geographically um, where those areas are? Um, 
So yes and yes and no. Yeah. Um, <laughs> all of the data in this dashboard is coming from a bunch of different places. Mm -hmm. So depending on what you are interested in, um, you can click through to learn more about that. And what is available will be different for each of those topics depending on the data that's available. So here um, we have some uh, data about increase in um, Medicaid enrollment. So we've got that uh, broken down by adults and Apple Health for kids. So in this case with the Medicaid, the only breakdown that I'm seeing is by age, but that will um, again vary by each source. Um, another tool that might be helpful um, which doesn't really show changes that have happened since the COVID um, outbreak, but it shows other information about counties or communities geographically within King County that might be more vulnerable um, is this vulnerable communities data tool. Um, and uh, we can put the link to this in the chat box as well. But this shows um, a variety of different topics related to um, vulnerability to COVID as well as the social and economic impacts of COVID. And this is broken down. Um, if you will open up these, uh, this is broken down by geography. So if you're looking for data also, we definitely welcome you to reach out to us. There's contact information um, at the bottom of these pages. Um, and we would be happy to help you find data about different communities in King County. Um, we're always happy to help, help you find the many resources that are on the website. Oh, the highway one, maybe. Oh, yeah. Does that show different roads? Yeah. Yeah. It shows like the different roads in King County um, and in Washington and like how uh, traffic has changed in those areas. So that's one of the indicators that kind of, I guess, like not directly, but um, mm -hmm. but indirectly kind of breaks it down by geographic zone as well. So if I look, I'm, I change it right now to see um, State Route 167 in Kent. That's changed. Um, it's gone down recently compared to how mm -hmm. it was in 2019 versus if I'm just choosing randomly 520. Um, we can see the change. It doesn't look like it's actually down as far unless the scale changed, which it might have. Well, we were about to talk about these indicators um, related to reopening. Those indicators, um, these criteria were created um, at the state level. So they apply to counties across Washington state and each county does apply to our state government to move forward through those phases of reopening. So you can see on this key indicators dashboard, um, a brief description of what the criteria that the state considers in reviewing those applications to um, move into a different phase of reopening are. And then you can also see how, uh, how King County has been doing on that indicator over time. So this one is um, what are the trends in the numbers of reported cases. And the criteria that uh, we'd like to be at before we move into a new phase is that the total number of cases um, for the last two weeks is less than 25 per 100,000 residents. You can see that right now, we're way above that. We were down here briefly below it um, before we moved into phase two. The other criteria include the reproductive number. Um, that is a measure that means on average for each person that we know to be infected with coronavirus, how many other people are they passing it along to? If everybody who's sick infects one other person, um, we will have stable numbers. If everybody who's sick infects less than one person, which is our target here, then we will see our outbreak declining we are currently at about 1.4, so we're not as low down as we'd like to be. Um, and I'm not gonna go in detail through all the other criteria, but you can see here how we're doing um, our healthcare system readiness, looking good, some aspects of the testing capacity going better than others. Um, would anybody on the ANI team like to chime in about, um, about those thresholds and how those 
decisions were made. Yeah, hi, this is Sarkis. Um, yeah, I think you um, kind of summarized it well. I th the, one of the things I would highlight is that uh, these thresholds are both national, uh, state, and local level uh, considerations were made, where um, they are from the framework that was developed nationally at the CDC as like a guidance. And then our the King County health officer, along with health officers across the state, um, kind of discussed what would be an appropriate metric for the large counties as well as the smaller counties. And um, there was kind of a uh, back and forth about what are achievable metrics, what do they actually mean, and are they, um, do they really impact decision making? So um, a handful of metrics were decided on to be uh, uniform across the state. And that's kind of where these uh, originated from. And then we also added a couple internally, which are the hospitalization um, and deaths trends, uh, where those are not statewide metrics. Those are um, for us, because we thought those would be uh, things that are important for the public to understand what the severity of illness is. Because as you can see from our current view, our case counts and our incidence has been, um, you know, much higher than needed. Uh, but we are also not seeing a, um, a similar increase in hospitalizations or deaths, where for hospitalizations, while we are currently not meeting this target of being flat or decreasing, it is a relatively small change. And for deaths, we are still on a flat decreasing trend. So, um, it's one of the ways that our leadership uses uh, these metrics to make decisions on what is the actual severity of the illness, because an increase in case, cases is not, uh, doesn't live in isolation. We also want to know, uh, is it more severe? Is it affecting different communities? Um, and is it more a result of testing, more widespread um, disease and, uh, spread, or, you know, there's a lot of different um, reasons or uh, explanations of things. Mm -hmm. And this is supposed to provide just a snapshot of that, not supposed to be a holistic um, uh, guide, I guess, to everything yeah. that's going on. But, and I will just want to add that we are going to move towards making the charts a little bit uh, easier to read because right now they are very jaggedy, um, but they will be slightly easier to read as right now it's a daily rate and it will uh, be instead of a instead of 14 day rate so that it matches more clearly to what the metric is so that you could follow along more clearly and it's not as um, challenging um, of a literacy. Right. Yeah, one just random note that I will add, um, about especially this, this rate of cases is the time period really matters. I was having mm -hmm. a conversation with a family member in another state and she was looking at rates for her community and we were like, well, that's really different. Um, and I realized that her health department was sharing rates by day. So we would expect that to be a lot smaller than rates over a period of 14 days. So um, that's just one thing to look out for and keep your eye on um, if you're exploring data from different sources, especially. Yeah, so these little tabs up yeah. here um, can be really helpful if you are looking for more details. Mm -hmm. um, this one shows demographic breakdowns um, as part of this, the daily outbreak summary dashboard. So we have race and ethnicity, and we do have age in um, decade-long groups here. So is, uh, are the rates that we're seeing, mm -hmm. is it due to lack of testing availability or a lack of people getting to go tested? Uh, that metric is a little bit challenging, and this was one of the, it was a very weird decision on how, to, how that came about. But uh, the goal of more than 50 is really a, uh, a positivity rate of 2%, meaning that for every 50 people that we test, one person tests positive. So one out of 50 is the 2% mark. So our goal is to really get to a place where we're testing more than 
50 people and finding one or less positive cases. And that is to indicate that there's widespread, it's multiple things. One is to indicate that we have lots of testing going on beyond just very targeted populations that are more likely to have a higher rates of infections, but also that our overall uh, infection rates are really low. So what we're seeing now with this decrease, and you can kind of tell from the graphic that at one point we were actually above the threshold. Uh, and we were met meeting this metric in late May. Mm -hmm. And what happened since late May is one, we increased testing, which uh, identified more cases, but we've also seen an increase in positivity rate, which uh, also indicates that uh, there, there are just more people testing positive each day. And what I would say for, and this, it, it, I will just admit that this is, um, it requires a lot more background and um, I think um, a larger understanding of these metrics and behind the scenes. But if you combine this with the metric that's above two, um, sorry, the IDM model, Sarah J, if you could scroll up to that. So this kind of represents what is the um, effective reproductive rate. And you could kind of use these in, um, somewhat of an understanding to conceptualize what we, are, what we are thinking is happening across the county where anything above one indicates that more than one person is being infected by each new positive. So that means that if uh, so one person gets ill and they infect on average two people, then our disease is spreading more, um, is growing each day. Um, so that also leads to a higher positivity rate, and it leads to um, more people testing positive, which uh, will drive the other metric down. So they all kind of uh, zigzag with each other. Um, I hope that kind of answers it, but, uh, or at least provides some more confusion. No, I think, Sarkis, you're, um, what you're speaking to is the fact that we can't take these measurements in isolation, right? Because even when you explained it before, it was like, although we might not be hitting our target of 25 per 100,000 K, um, the hospitalization rates are still low, right? So these are all like in conjunction with each other in order to think about like how, how do they influence policy um, moving forward um, in this like COVID world. Yeah, and I will just add that, you know, from our conversations with our health officer, as well as our, what conversations the health officer has with the county executive and um, our, you know, governor, governor's office, the goal for the, all of these metrics is not to be a uh, binary, mm -hmm. we're failing or we're not failing. It's more of a, okay, this is what, this is what we're hoping for. This is where we're at. How does this relate to everything else and how can we get to a point of truly understanding is this a concerning uh not meeting the target or is this a we're not meeting the target but everything else looks okay and i will say some of these have more weight to them than others right um if our hospitals are over capacity uh that will be a much more concerning one than if we're if our testing is not as quick because we want to make sure that our hospitals have enough room for patients to uh, arrive into the ER with. Because um, if we have overflowing hospitals, that's much more concerning than if it's taking three days on average for people to get tested from symptom onset than two. So th there are just things that are, uh, are placed more valuable and they're placed in combination. Is there data on the number of days that patients stay hospitalized? Um, by age bracket? That is a great question. I'm going to look for the answer to that on the syndromic surveillance data dashboard. What this term means is that it's data that is coming, um, basically coming from our hospitals. So what we do have here um, is um, what percent of emergency department visits are for COVID-like illness in King County emergency rooms. Um, we can see that for emergency rooms as well as for inpatient hospitalizations um, and pneumonia. 
And it looks like we don't have a lot of other breakouts, but yeah. there's some more detailed information about what syndromic data is. Like we said, like I said before, there's six different tabs and each different dashboard has like several sub dashboards. Um, so we weren't able to cover everything, but there is a lot of information that we didn't cover. Um, and if that's something that you're interested in, please feel free to reach out and then we can have that conversation.